Welcome back to Module 1, Unit 2, Lesson 2 of our study of the fundamentals of operating systems based on the textbook Operating System Concepts, 10th edition by Abraham Silbershots, Greg Gagney, and Peter Galvin. Let's pick up where we left off. This figure shows one view of the various operating system services and how they interrelate. You can pause the video if you'd like to study this image, but we will proceed with our lecture. The command interpreter is an approach that has been around almost from the beginning of operating system development. Most operating systems, including Linux, Unix, and Windows, treat the command interpreter as a special program that is running when the process is initiated or when a user first logs on to interactive systems. On systems with multiple command interpreters to choose from, the interpreters are known as shells. For example, on Unix or Linux, a user may choose from among several different shells, including the C shell or the Born shell that you see here, the Corn shell, and several others. Third-party shells and free user-written shells are also available. Most shells provide similar functionality, and a user's choice of which shell to use is generally based upon personal preference. This figure shows that Born Shell or Bash Shell command interpreter being used on a Mac OS. Where you see a PBG dollar sign in this image, you are seeing the prompt for a command. And this is where the user would input the command that the user would like to run. In this example, there appears to be four commands that have been entered, including one that shows the status of I.O. devices and another that shows a listing of files and directories in the Active Directory. I'll let you figure out what the other two are. The image ends with the prompt patiently waiting for another command to be entered. The main function of the command interpreter is to get and execute the next user-specified command. Many of the commands given at this level manipulate files, tasks like create, delete, list, print, copy, execute, and so on. The various shells available on Unix systems command can be implemented in two general ways. In one approach, the command interpreter itself contains the code to execute the command. Another approach used by Unix, among other operating systems, implements most commands through system programs. In this case, the command interpreter does not understand the command in any way. It merely uses the command to identify a file to be loaded into memory and executed. Thus, the Unix command to delete a file, rm space file.txt, would search for a file named rm load it into memory, and execute it with the parameter file.txt. RM stands for remove, so this command would remove a document called file.txt. The logic associated with the RM command would be defined completely by the code in the file RM. In this way, programmers can add new commands to the system easily by creating new files with proper program logic. The command interpreter program, which can be small, does not have to be changed for new commands to be added. Do you remember when I said I thought this was better than the GUI? Well, this is one computer user who got over that one in a hurry. Although the ability to use a command interpreter comes in very handy from time to time. Another strategy for interfacing with the operating system is through a user-friendly graphical user interface, or GUI. In this case, rather than entering commands directly via a command line interface, users use a mouse-based window and menu system characterized by a desktop metaphor. I've seen some really messy desktops over the years, both electronic desks and hard, flat office desks. 
The user moves the mouse to position its pointer on images or icons that represent programs, files, directories, and system functions. Depending upon the mouse pointer's location, clicking a button on the mouse can invoke a program, select a file or directory, also known as a folder, and pull down a menu that contains commands. Graphical user interfaces first appeared due in part to research taking place in the early 1970s at the Xerox PARC Research Facility, PARC, Palo Alto Research Center. The first UI appeared on the Xerox Alto computer in 1973, followed some time later by the Apple Lisa computer. However, graphical user interfaces became widespread with the advent of the Apple Macintosh computers in the 1980s. The story goes that Steve Jobs, one of the founders of Apple, along with Steven Wozniak, took a tour of the Palo Alto facility of Xerox and immediately went back to Apple and informed everyone there that they were going to have to start all over again because he had just seen the future of computing or some words to that effect. The user interface for the Macintosh operating system has undergone various changes over the years. Microsoft's first version of Windows, version 1.0, was based on the addition of a GUI interface to the MS-DOS operating system. It actually originally worked like, much like one of those Unix shells, more or less sitting over DOS issuing users commands. Later versions of Windows, though, have made significant changes in the appearance of the graphical user interface, along with several enhancements of its functionality, and actually becoming part of the Windows operating system itself. I believe that began with Windows 95. Traditionally, Unix systems have been dominated by command line interfaces. Various GUI interfaces are available, however, with significant development in GUI designs from various open source projects. Open source. That means their source code is readily available for reading and for modification under specific license agreements. Because a command line interface or a mouse and keyboard system is impractical for most mobile systems, Smartphones and handheld tablets typically use a touch screen interface. Here, users interact by making gestures on the touch screen, for example, pressing and swiping fingers across the screen. Although earlier smartphones included a physical keyboard, most smartphones and tablets now simulate a keyboard on the touch screen. This figure illustrates the touch screen of the Apple iPhone. Both the iPad and the iPhone use the Springboard touchscreen interface. The choice of whether to use a command line or GUI interface is mostly one of personal preference. System administrators who manage computers and power users who have deep knowledge of a system frequently use the command line interface. For them, it's more efficient, giving them faster access to the activities they need to perform. Indeed, on some systems, only a subset of system function is available via the GUI, leaving the less common tasks to those who are command line knowledgeable. Further, command line interfaces usually make repetitive tasks easier, in part because they have their own programmability. For example, if a frequent task requires a set of command line steps, those steps can be recorded into a file, and that file, called a batch file, can be run just like a program. The batch file is not compiled into executable code, but rather is interpreted by the command line interface. You should have learned about compiled codes and interpretive code in earlier courses. These shell scripts are very common on systems that are command line oriented, such as Unix and Linux. In contrast, most Windows users are happy to use the Windows GUI environment and almost never use the shell interface. Recent versions of the Windows operating system provide both a standard GUI for desktop and traditional laptops and a touchscreen for tablets.
Mac OS has not provided a command line interface, always requiring its users to interface with the operating system using GUI. However, with the release of the Mac OS, which is in part implemented using the Unix kernel, the operating system now provides both an Aqua GUI and a command line interface. This figure is a screenshot of the Mac OS GUI. Although there are apps that provide a command line interface for iOS and Android mobile systems, they're rarely used. Instead, almost all users of mobile systems interact with their devices using the touch screen interface. The user interface can vary from system to system and even from user to user within a system. However, it is typically substantially removed from the actual system structure. The design of a useful and intuitive user interface is therefore not a function of the operating system. System calls provide an interface to the services made available by the operating system. These calls are generally available as functions written in C or C++, although certain low-level programs may have to be written using assembly language instructions. Tasks where hardware must be accessed directly are examples of this. Before we talk about how an operating system makes system calls available, let's illustrate how system calls are used by showing a simple program to read data from one file and copy them to another. The first bullet shows a common Unix command. The Unix command is CP, which is the copy command. The first input that the program will need is the names of the two files, the input file to be copied and the output file, which is the destination. It must be implemented in that order, otherwise it could be disastrous. By the way, a Microsoft DOS statement is written just like that other than the command is copy, not CP. If you try it on your Windows machine from the command prompt, try CP first. Microsoft has been very good about allowing their commands to emulate other operating systems. The worst thing that can happen is your operating system might reply with some kind of bad command error. Let's try it. Okay, I'll do a right click on the Windows flag and bring up Run. And I'll select it. Let me pull it up in the screen where we can see it. So it's going to run the command line, which is the command line interpreter, CMD. That starts the command line interpreter in Windows. Now, this, I mean, this is another. This is the window that it creates. Let me orient it for our screen. Give me a moment. Okay, now you see the command line screen, and you'll notice that I am sitting at a prompt. It's waiting for me to input some sort of a command. By default, when I open the command line interface, it takes me to my own personal directory. You see this is directory Michael, which is a subdirectory of users, which is a subdirectory of the root directory of the Windows disk drive. Now, Windows uh, directory system is organized into a tree. This is not a binary tree. This is a general purpose tree, which allows you to have multiple branches off of each level of the tree. Okay, let's then put that command. What was it? CP? All right, so I'll type in CP. Well, first, let me see what's available in this folder. So let's see where I am. I'll type the Windows command to give me a listing. And you'll notice that I am seeing a lot of different folders. This, this DIR indicates a folder. And so I think I want to go into one called temp. So I'm going to issue another uh, command line interpreter command, CD, and type temp which means I want to log into the temp folder that you see right there in our list. So I'll hit enter and notice that my prompt has changed. Now I am in the temp folder of Michael 
under users I'll type DIR command see what's there and that's not the one I want so I'm going to back up I'll enter put CD in the two dots which takes me back to the parent and let's list that command again DIR and what was I looking for classes let's type in change directory to classes hit enter and notice now I am in the classes folder now let's type DIR and see what's there ah I got a couple of files demo.bat and n.txt now their, com their command a while ago was to copy a file and they use CP so I type CP and type n.txt which is the source file that I want and I'll type out.txt to copy it to another file name. Alright, I use CP which is the Unix command. Let's see what Windows tells me. Oh, Windows didn't like that. Okay, so this is one of those times when it's not so daggum friendly. So let's try it the Windows way. C-O-P-Y n.txt space out.txt and hit enter. Boom. Now it says the file is copied. Really? Is it? Let's see. DIR. And look, we have in.txt and out.txt. So we just use a command line system call to call up a file called copy. When we executed it, it allowed us to copy the file. Now, I see that there's a demo.bat up there. That is a batch file. We talked a moment ago about batch files. That happens to be a Windows or DOS type batch file. In the case of Windows, the you have to use the extension BAT. It will not it will not just execute any file. Whereas in Unix it would have if I could just said demo, if you use demo for a file name without any extension, it would have worked fine. But in Windows it's got to have a BAT to execute. Now I'm gonna type another now I'm going to make another system call. I'm going to type CLS, which is a system call where I'm asking the operating system to clear this screen. All right, the screen is cleared. If I type DIR, I'll see everything that's in this screen. Nothing else. I'm going to do it again. CLS, just to clear the screen, and it's done. Now, we had a batch file on there called demo.bat. Let's execute it. I just type demo and hit enter. Except I type dip demo and hit enter. And it just did a lot of things. So let me go back and look. Uh, the first thing it did was it backed up. It backed up to the to the classes, to the Michael folder. And now here I am at the Michael folder. And I'm telling it to log me in to classes only this time I use the absolute name rather than the relative file name when we did it a while ago I said uh, CD space classes which is a relative file name meaning that it's relative to my position in the uh, uh, drive but this time I use the absolute file name which is given the entire path to this folder C colon backslash users backslash Michael backslash classes alright so it did that and then uh, it shows me that listing there uh, no where did I do DIR there it is right there it changed the folder notice right here it says classes and then I typed or this this batch file input the DIR command which gave me a listing of those files that are in this folder that we remember we just saw them scroll down some more it changed folders again and took me back to Michael and then it changed folders again and only this time it used a relative name it took me to that temp folder we saw a while ago that I went to by mistake and then it asked for a directory and there are those same files we saw in that temp folder so you see we're using the command line interface to execute many many different commands and here we say this utility said uh, DIR, or C, no, it says CD backslash, which takes me back to the root folder, 
and then when I ask for a directory of the root folder it shows me everything at the very high end of the directory structure and then I ask it to for that CD space classes remember we did it a while ago but this time it doesn't doesn't give it to me it says that I can't find that that's because that's a relative file name and since classes exist under the user folder here under the Michael folder under that it can't find it I would have had to have typed which I'll type right now CD space backslash which identifies the root users backslash Michael backslash classes and hit enter now it changed because I used the absolute name instead of the relative name. Well, my goodness, you just got a very quick, brief introduction to command line uh, scripting. By the way, let me see about that file. Let me do a DIR again. There's that demo file. Let me use another one called more and type more demo dot bat. And there you see the content of the demo batch file. It says CD backslash that CD dot dot took me back to the root. Then it said CD slash CD took me back to classes. Then it did the DIR. Then it backed up one again. Then it changed to the temp folder. Then it asked for a directory. Then it backed up to the root. And then it input the DIR, and then it tried to change directory to classes, but classes did not exist as a subfolder of temp of root. It exists as a subfolder of classes. Well, there you go. Really, really brief introduction to operating systems. Let's quit playing and go back to work. So I'm type exit. Well, that little excursion into issuing system calls in Windows via the command line interpreter to created somewhat of a long lesson. So let's take a break here. I hope you've been using your study guide to take notes. Go ahead and study those. Take care of any other business you might have. And when you're ready, come on back to Lesson 3.